Hello again, and uh, welcome to this class. This, as we shared yesterday, it is the Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism class, uh, where we'll be going through this 100 and, uh, 107 uh, question and answers that really unpacks the uh, revelation of the Bible uh, very, very well and making us really to know what is uh, the Bible te uh, teaches us and that we'll be able to hold on to that uh, for our faith <clears throat> and practice. Um, yeah, today I'll begin with a prayer and then we will get into our class today. So uh, once again, welcome to this class. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, we come before you this time in this class of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. We come to you, Lord, with an open heart to learn from you. Therefore, Lord, we welcome the Holy Spirit to be with us in this class at this time, that it may help us to unpack the truths of your word, to see the truth, and also to give us a heart of putting down any kind of falsehood if we are not holding on to to the truth and have the courage by grace to go after the truth for the glory and honor of your name. Help us to understand, help us to apply, help us to enjoy, and help us, Lord, to be able to proclaim it even to other people as well. We give you glory and praise, and I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Um, so I don't know how you, uh, you have found uh, the first class to be. Um, I've received some of your um, feedback and which I was very encouraged and very humbling as well to know that um, what I shared yesterday was helpful. And what I'll be sharing today, uh, I really just believe that it's going to be helpful uh, for your life as well. And I hope in the coming days as we uh, share this, uh, you will always find something helpful in your work of faith and also especially in your evangelism field because the truth that we are receiving from the word of God is not just something um, for us, but it is for us to apply it correctly in our lives to give glory to God. And through that, we'll be able to stand as witnesses to proclaim that truth uh, out in the evangelism field. So as you're going through the Westminster Shorter Catechism, uh, you should always remember uh, the identity of our seminary, which is evangelism theology. We are looking at this from the uh, eyes of evangelism. And uh, that's one thing that has been lost uh, you know, over the years. Uh, but I really hope that God will bless us and give us the grace to be able to see this uh, truth of God's word in the eyes of evangelism for us first and also that through us we can also uh, stand in the field to proclaim it to many other people yeah so thank you very much those who've given feedback and uh, i really want you to do that continue to engage well with myself uh, and uh, give the feedback so i've also shared with pastor joseph about um, uh, how this class will look like i think he's going to explain in detail uh, but it's obvious that we cannot finish all the 107 questions this semester. Um, we will pray uh, together with, you know, with Reverend Kim and see uh, what we can do about it, but we'll try at least to finish the first part. Yesterday I shared that this uh, catechism is or can be divided into two parts. Uh, one part uh, is talking about what we need to believe, what man is to believe concerning God, uh, that is from question four to question 38. And then from question 39 to the last question 107, it is now about the duty that God requires uh, of us. Um, so if we get the first bit very well, I can leave that as a section for you to study on your own. Uh, but if there is any need, uh, we can continue uh, with that in the coming semester maybe. Uh, but uh, we'll try as much as we can to use the remaining time to finish at least the first part, which is very, very important. And I will explain that in the conclusion of this uh, uh, class today. Uh, today we will cover uh, 
question number two and question number three. I know in the outline I've sent it to Joseph, um, I've said that I'll be covering question two today and question three tomorrow, uh, but I've already covered, uh, uh, but my intention is to cover uh, two and three today and then cover question number four uh, tomorrow because that is a very big uh, section. I might have to repeat that next week again. So today, uh, once again, let's just jump into our, um, our class. Uh, the question that we have today uh, is question number two and answer number two, obviously. So this question says, what role has God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him? And the answer given there, uh, if we can read together, please. The word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. Let's just recap uh, what we did uh, last time. We're gonna read this question and answer again in a minute. But remember yesterday, <clears throat> we did question number one. And uh, if we can uh, do it together again, just the question and the answer alone, not the lecture, obviously. Um, so what is the chief end of man? That is the question number one in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is the chief end of man? Together, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Let's do that again. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And so that's coming to the second question. I'm gonna read the question again, and then if we could both, uh, you and I read the answer together, and those who have memorized it, let's try to read uh, it without reading, but just reciting it from your head. Uh, what role has God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him? Together, the word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments, is the only role to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. Again, together. The word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. I remember I was doing this uh, actually today with my daughter, um, uh, who's four. And one of the tricks of doing this with children it is to not do it uh, with a voice that is just like a regular voice that, that I'm reading it. I would it now, but to shout it, to like really uh, do it with a very high voice, very high, almost like a yelling voice. Uh, if you have seen, uh, I don't know if some of you have been to areas like Garissa or areas like Wajia, uh, those are the northern part of Kenya. And the Muslims, they have these classes at night, they call them Duxi, which is basically a class where they just memorize their own catechism. Um, they just yell to the top of their lungs when they're reading those uh, scriptures. So when they're doing this with children, um, I found it working with, with my daughter because uh, um, she's forced. So concentration is very low at that age. Uh, she wants to do other things and still do catechism. But when, I, when we are yelling these things out loud, she's able to at least uh, you know, focus and look at me and also try to yell them out loud as well. So if you are considering doing the catechism with children, uh, maybe that might be a, um, a good uh, methodology. So I'll read uh, two verses from the Bible. And again, I'm reading from the uh, New King James Version. It might be a little hard for myself and for the hearers as well, uh, but you can also follow in your Bibles. And then we're gonna get into the lecture. Um, the first verse that I'd like you to read is um, 2 Timothy 3.16. So 2 Timothy, uh, 3.16, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That is 2 Corinthians 3.16. The other one I'm going to read is uh, Revelations uh, 22, verse 18 and 19. Revelation 22, 
verse 18 and 19. It says, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. Amen. Um, so today uh, we're dealing with a question about um, the Bible. So what role has God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him? This is coming from yesterday's uh, lecture. Uh, which really puts uh, uh, man's chief end, the only purpose of our life, it is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We spoke about how the world uh, glorifies God. When you look at be uh, beautiful valleys and beautiful rivers and oceans and everything, uh, you can see the glory of God in creation. But man can, was given this privilege to be able to glorify God willingly that we glorify God, not because we're just reflecting uh, his glory like a mirror, but we, are, we want to do that. So not only man, but also angels were given uh, this privilege. Every uh, thinking, rational uh, being that has moral responsibility is offered that privilege by the creator himself, that he'll be able to glorify God, but also that he wants to do that. And through that heart of wanting to glorify him, he's glorified even more. And um, we saw in the end, because this is the only thing that man needs to do now. So what rule has God, has God given any rule that we can read, that we can, like a manual by which we might find uh, ways by which we can glorify and enjoy God? And that is the Bible. And this question is uh, it's a question that really indicates the Bible and makes us want to really read the Bible. So I really hope that through this class, once again, we will have the assurance that the Bible is the word of God. And more than that, is that uh, we want to uh, read the Bible and we want to uh, understand from the Bible uh, the rule of God that he has given us that makes us want to glorify him and to enjoy him uh, forever. Um, so we shall begin in the introduction by mentioning that, that uh, mankind needs true wisdom, not just wisdom or knowledge. We need, if you have wisdom, it has to be the true wisdom. If you've got knowledge, that knowledge has to be the true knowledge. Otherwise, there is, there is no reason of holding onto the false knowledge, and in the end, uh, you suffer the consequences of that. So this true knowledge or this true wisdom uh, first of all, it's a hidden wisdom and a hidden knowledge, and it can only be known through a revelation. God has to reveal that knowledge uh, or that wisdom, and then we can know it. If you look in the book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 21, we see that God has hidden things from the prudent and has revealed them unto babes and to children. So some of the best intelligent people in our world today, they, might, they may lack the true wisdom or the true knowledge and vice versa. Some of the most uh, uh, no, uh, common people, some of the most common people in this world, those people might be in possession of a true wisdom, a true knowledge. The second thing that I'd like to mention here in the introduction is that man on his own is not able to know the truth. You cannot know the truth by yourself. Truth is something that has to come from outside. You, know, you cannot say that uh, I know the truth and I have figured it out by myself. This is the truth. Our truth always has to come from an extra uh, source apart from ourselves, even apart from humanity itself. So all the human beings in the whole world together even if they put all the heads together, they cannot come out with the truth. Truth has to come outside of humanity. And that we see very well with uh, scientific discovery. Uh, for example, this discovery of stars, they, mess, they make these telescopes, they look into the universe, into the, in, in, you know, into the space, they discover some stars, 
Uh, years later, they discover uh, even better telescopes. They manufacture even better telescopes and they look into the universe again and they discover other kinds of stars. So every time they discover new stars, they knew something new. They know something new. But most importantly is that they have more things to now begin to know. Up until the last telescope, we think we know everything, but when you uh, upgrade your telescope, you have more things for you to know. So the more you discover on your own, the more you realize that you know nothing, that there's a lot to know. And the reason is because uh, mankind was not made to know everything. God knows everything. And only God could give mankind some kind of knowledge, some kind of revelation. Uh, philosophically speaking, um, knowledge is defined as a justified true belief. So whatever belief you have, it has to be justified independently for it to become what you actually know. So we can only depend on revelation. If we want to live a life that glorifies God, a life that enjoys God forever, we can't figure that out on our own. We must receive a revelation from God that says, this is how you can glorify me. This is how you can enjoy me. And that's what the Bible was given. And that's why the Bible was given to us. So we have two kinds of revelations. Um, one is the natural revelation. In Psalms 19, as we saw yesterday, all heavens declare the glories of the risen God. That's from a song, but from Psalms 19 it says, all heavens declare and the sky, all the skies, all the firmaments, all the skies show the work or the handiwork of God. In Romans 1.20, we know that his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived through the natural revelation. In the things that have been made, God's power and his nature has been revealed. And the Bible says clearly perceived. So we have this revelation we call natural revelation. By looking into the world, by looking into the, uh, into the universe, uh, we can have some knowledge about God. We can have some knowledge about God. Uh, but we also do have what we call special revelation. Now, in the case of Adam, for example, Adam was created by God. <clears throat> he had a very natural uh, revelation where he could name all the animals. Uh, you, you know, you become a cat. You, know, you are a tree. You are a leopard. You are a jaguar. You know, he could name all the animals like that. That's how much, uh, you know, he could really see God's wisdom and he was able to really enjoy that with the wisdom of God. But in Genesis 2.17, God gives him a covenant. A covenant. And it is through that Genesis 2.17 that he's, he's now uh, supposed to understand everything else um, in the universe. It is in light of the special word of God that he's now supposed to understand the whole of it, you know, the universe. That also means that we must understand natural revelation in the light of the special revelation that we have. So what I'm saying here, simply, let me just try to put this in simple words. Um, you might look into the universe and you can feel that, oh, God exists. God exists. There, there must be a creator. Maybe he even created me. When looking to the universe, the natural revelation might reveal that aspect of God. But you cannot look into the universe just an unbeliever looking into the mountains somewhere in Mongol and say that God is my creator and he's also my redeemer in Christ, the mediator. So he will, this person, he or she, will know about God, will feel about God and might know even other attributes about God, his wisdom, his power, uh, his ability to know, like he's omniscient um, and also omnipotent. He can probably feel all of those things, but he can never, from the natural revelation, realize that this God is not only my creator, but today he is also my redeemer, he's my savior. 
is my Christ. He can never know that through the natural revelation. To do that, you need to receive the special revelation that comes. So what happened in Genesis chapter 3? In Genesis 3, Adam rejected the special revelation. Adam rejected the very word of God that is supposed to look into everything else in light of that word of God. Do not eat of the fruit of the knowledge of, uh, uh, of, of, of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you shall surely die. That was the key for him to understand every other thing, every other thing in the world. That was the covenant by which he was supposed to realize that he has a relationship with God. He has a relationship with God. So special revelation makes us realize that um, you have a relationship with this God. And it is in light of that that you see each and every other thing in the world. So Adam uh, and Eve rejected God and immediately they began to walk in, uh, in darkness. There was no way to find the truth. No matter how much they tried, they cannot find the truth because it is only that word of God that brings light into our lives. Because the moment Adam and Eve have sinned, the whole of humanity is now walking in darkness. So the uh, natural revelation is sufficient, is completely uh, enough to leave all the 7 billion people of the world, to leave them without any excuse because they can see the glory of God. They can see the glory of God. And it can go to some extent to know that he is a creator, that there must be a creator. And if there is a creator and I don't know him, maybe I am in trouble. They can come to that point, maybe I am in trouble. If there is a creator who created all of these things, then I should at least know him and serve him, but I can't now because I've done things in my life that I don't think he's going to like it. So you begin to um, feel like you have no excuse. And this is what uh, Paul writes in the book of Romans chapter one, they leave them without any excuse. I might read this verse um, in Romans chapter one. So I'm going to read from verse 18. It says, for the wrath of God, which uh, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. So they are without excuse. The things that they should know about God, they do already know. Uh, that revelation is sufficient to leave them without any excuse. So they have seen all of God's attributes but it's only the Bible, as we said earlier, that reveals that this God is also our redeemer in Christ, the mediator. So we need this special revelation for us to be able to be saved. To solve the problem of sin in our lives, we need the special revelation. To solve the problem of Satan in this world, we need the special revelation. To solve the separation problem, we must uh, receive the special revelation. And often uh, one of the biggest questions that comes here is, it, is that, is the Bible the only sacred book then? What about the Quran? What about the Bhagavata or any other sacred uh, scriptures that we have in the world today? Why is it that the Bible then uh, is what we must follow for the way of salvation? And the answer is very, very simple more simpler than actually 
many philosophers and theologians think. Um, I normally ex explain it this way. There is one God, there is one God in the universe. Uh, the next lecture will be about God. And once you start unpacking what the Bible teaches about God, or if it's just a, a, a definition of what God is, you realize that there can never be two gods. It's impossible. An infinite being who is all powerful, who is all knowing, then there cannot be two uh, beings. So uh, there is one God. And if there is one God and he cannot be known, um, the knowledge of God is way out of reach from us in one way. But it is possible to know him through the revelation that he has given. We cannot just figure it out by ourselves. So this one God revealed himself to his people or to, to, to human beings in that, in that case. Why would he reveal himself in many, many, many uh, scriptures that even contradict themselves? God should know that God revealed himself only through one revelation, only through one scripture. So one of them is right. So philosophically, we cannot say that the Quran is right and the Bible is correct as well. If you're saying that the Bible is right, you're saying the Quran is wrong. If you're saying that the Quran is right, then you're saying the Bible is wrong. You cannot, some people, many Christians have said that, oh yeah, you, you read what you're reading, I read what I'm reading. Oh, that doesn't have any harmony in terms of just understanding it. So one of them is right and the other is wrong. And you need to also uh, have this. So which one is right? Which one is correct? Because only one is correct. Only then it is correct because others will be wrong. So what we do is we try to read the Bible and read the Quran. I, I've got a, a copy of Quran as well myself, the shelves here, uh, which I'm trying to read. I've got the Book of Mormon as well here. I'm trying to read as well. I've read most of, of, you know, most of it already. But the thing is, what you're reading must really be coherent with uh, reality itself. We have Muslims, we have Mormons, we have Jehovah's Witnesses, we have Christians, we have Catholics, but we have one reality. So what is in the Quran, if it is not matching with the reality that we have in the world today, then Quran cannot be correct. What is in the bad data, if it's not coherent and uh, it doesn't correspond with our reality, then it is also wrong. The Bible is the only book that reveals truth and claims to be true. It is the only book in the whole of the universe that is consistent with reality that we all share, that is coherent with reality, that corresponds with our reality. So we need to read the Bible. The Quran does not match with our reality. If it was time, I would give more examples or specific examples where the Quran really contradicts with reality, really contradicts with reality. The major one is about salvation, for example. This issue I, I, that I shared yesterday about God balancing your good and your wrong uh, and saying that God is holy again and a holy God will accept sinners um, to live with him forever with their sins. What's going to happen to their sins? This God that the Quran is also claiming to be a just God but these guys are coming in with sin. You see, God will not judge people for what good they have done. It is for the wrong things that they have done. They have done. Anyway, my point here is uh, there is only one revelation coming from only one God. And that revelation, uh, you can take all of them and read all of them. You would probably come to the same conclusion that the Bible is the word of God and not any other material. So today, when you are reading here um, uh, in, the, in the answer, <clears throat> so the question that we're dealing now with is, what role has God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him? And in the answer, we said, the word of God, which is contained, which is contained in the scriptures, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments. So what do we, what do we really mean by the word contained in? I know some unfaithful, uh, theologians have said things like uh, that means that oh in the bible there, there is the word of god in the bible 
They don't say that the Bible is the word of God, but they say that there is God's word in the Bible. These are uh, liberalists. And because they say that in the Bible, there is God's word, their intention rather is to decide which one is and which one is not. So if something that is said and is beyond their comprehension or is demanding things that they're really difficult with them, they say, oh, this is just the word of Paul, or this is just the word of Moses. And they also don't really touch their lives at all, leave, just leaving them completely free. Or maybe that's the word of God, like love one another. That is the word of God. When I take up your cross and follow me, uh, that is someone else's words. So uh, liberals, they say that this phrase contained in means that the people who crafted uh, this document, this Westminster Shorter Catechism, uh, they meant that there is God's word in the Bible. But as I said yesterday, uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism was carefully uh, written. The words were carefully selected. And these people did not mean that. They never meant that. We have the, uh, the new orthodoxy, um, you know, people like uh, Karl Barth, who, 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 who um, really led the world into like uh, new modernism. Um, they believe that the Bible is, uh, it, it is a book that has mistakes, it's fallible. It is the word of man. Uh, and they were saying that God, it is the word of man, but God can use those words to bring in the true word of God in somebody's heart when they're reading them. So it's not God's word, it's man's word, but God could use them to bring the truth of God's word in the reader, which is also wrong. So our view of this contained in is that every word of the Bible, the very words of the Bible are from God. This is the reformed perspective. The whole Bible, it is the truth of God and it is the truth to both believers and non-believers. So it doesn't cease to be truth because somebody is an unbeliever. Even to the non-believers, it still stands as a truth of the word of God. Um, the Bible has three uh, attributes or characteristics that we're gonna look at now very briefly. Um, the first uh, attribute of the Bible is that it's infallible, infallible word of God. That means that everything that is in the Bible speaks the truth. Everything in the Bible says the truth. Um, so everything in the Bible is true. But there's uh, one um, uh, thing we must put in mind that it doesn't that the infallibility of the of the Bible doesn't mean that uh, you can just take one phrase from the Bible, just just you know like one phrase. Uh, independently and whatever it reads is the truth. Doesn't mean that everything has to be uh, seen and read in the context of which uh, it actually appears in. I'll show you um, Psalms 14 and Psalms 53. I can just show you one actually because there's the same. Uh, let's just go to some, uh, Psalms 14. And if you read Psalms 14, it says, the fool says in his heart, comma, and then uh, quotes. So beginning, beginning of the quote, there is no God, end of quotes. There is no God, and the quotes end. So if you take that phrase, there is no God, uh, that is not true. So the infallibility of the Bible, when you say that everything in the Bible is true, the context is also uh, considered when that statement is made. Um, and also sometimes you read passages in the Bible that are very difficult to understand. You have no idea what this actually means. Then you should always go back to the simpler uh, contexts or simpler passages. And in light of those simple passages, you can understand everything else in the Bible. Um, for example, when you study um, the doctrines of the end times, eschatology. So obviously you'll have to go to the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel 
and you're trying to understand what the Bible teaches about the end and how the end will come. Uh, but if you really want to understand eschatology, you should understand Matthew uh, 28 uh, from verse 18 to 20. That's very simple, nothing complicated, nothing difficult to understand. Jesus giving marching orders and saying, this is how uh, I want you to proceed from now on onwards. So you should always go to those simple texts that are very uh, clear to understand. And in light, uh, in light of those simple texts, you try to understand the difficult uh, parts. But uh, the point that I was really making here is that uh, everything in the Bible has a context, be it historical or geographic or uh, the destinational uh, context or anything like that. You should always get to that, that you can understand understand what the Bible is always, uh, that the Bible always talks about. <clears throat> the second uh, attribute of the Bible is, it is very clear. Even the book of Revelation is very clear. I know that's a sensitive um, area for many people because of John Calvin's attitude. Um, but the book of Revelation is probably one of the most clearest books in the Bible. The word that we use here maybe uh, theologically is uh, perspicuity or scripture, perspicuity is very clear. Even a child can read and understand what the Bible says. Obviously there will be sections where you, you cannot make sense of it, but what the Bible collectively talks about, even a child who knows how to read can read and understand. That's how clear the Bible is. Uh, the reason I'm saying that the Revelation, the book of Revelation is very, very simple. Is because the answer is in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what the, the book is talking about. It's trying to reveal Jesus Christ. Not a dragon with seven heads, no. Or a woman standing on, on snakes and, and, uh, and the stars on her head. I mean, I don't even know what that even means even now. Or a beast coming out of the sea. When you read the book of Revelation, in the light of that it is trying to reveal something. It's not trying to hide something. Hence the name Revelation. Revelation is trying to reveal something to, to the reader. It's trying to reveal something. But uh, the attitude that we've had uh, in our present times is as if Revelation is trying to hide something. So people don't understand. So no, it's, not, it's not only Revelation, but the whole of the Bible is very clear. The message of the Bible is very clear. John 5.39. John 21, verse 30 to 31, very clear, very clear. Jesus is the Christ. That's what the Bible is trying to tell us. I always uh, pray like this when I'm reading the Bible or when I'm doing Bible, Bible study. I always say, God, what I don't know, teach me. Uh, what I don't um, see, open my eyes to see them. And what I don't have, give me. And then I say, amen, and I just open my eyes and I begin to do my Bible study. Because it is very clear. It is very clear. And the other uh, trait, the uh, you know, characteristics of the Bible that I'd like to cover uh, today, there are many others, but I'll just cover these three today. The infallibility, uh, the perspicuity, and also the sufficiency of scripture. The Bible is sufficient. The Catholics always will have the Bible and tradition to compile what they need to know about their faith. The Mormons, obviously, they're not Christians, but they will always have the Bible, the, new, the Old and the New Testament, and the Third Testament, apparently the Book of Mormon, together with them. Charismatics or evangelicals, Pentecostal Christians, will always have the Bible and other things. Oh, I dreamt this. And some of them even depend so heavily on dreams um, and word of what is called word of faith, uh, when somebody just utters, oh, the Lord is saying this and this and that. But the Bible is sufficient. The Bible is enough. You don't need anything else, only the Bible. One time I went to um, a region about 40 minutes away from here. Uh, I took the gospel there and I went there for several weeks. And then one day I was given a request by somebody. Uh, he said, why don't you prepare a message for a Bible study group? I said, oh, that's wonderful. What do you want me to talk about? 
um, and he just said um, something to do with uh, dreams and how, you know, dreams and visions and how through those things we can uh, hear the word of God. And so I went there and um, I, I, I took uh, my Bible with me and there we were in the book of Hebrews, I think that's what I did. Yeah, so I took the book of Hebrews with me and I said, the topic today is about how God speaks to us. Yeah, that was, a, uh, that was my assignment, how God speaks to us. And judging by the nature of that fellowship, uh, it's a very charismatic Pentecostal evangelical fellowship. Maybe they wanted me to talk about how God speaks to us uh, through visions and dreams. Because before that, uh, one of the ladies was telling me how her son was sleeping and then suddenly there was a voice and then he opened his eyes, he couldn't see anyone, but the voice was still there. That's how he became a Christian. So I was supposed to speak to, to a congregation like that. So I went with Hebrews chapter one, said long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days that we live in, these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he has created the world. And he goes on, he's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So my point here in all of that, I just read to the end just because it was, was a very um, good passage that praises our Lord Jesus Christ. But what I wanted to read basically was that God has spoken through Jesus Christ. And that has been given to us now through scriptures. Um, a, a Peter, Apostle Peter, in his letter as well, he addresses the same thing. Um, let me quickly go there as well. I'll tell you the verse after I find it. Um, and I didn't think about this verse. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's in the book of, um, I think, Second Peter 2, uh, that Peter himself talks about his experience of the transfiguration, where he was actually standing there and he had him, himself, he had God saying, the voice of God saying, this is my son. I'm well placed by him, listen to him. He had those words of God, but now he's telling the church that you have something better than hearing God himself speaking. You have something better, and that was referring to the scriptures. You've got it there in your hands. That is better than what we heard on the mountain of transfiguration or at River Jordan when he was being baptized. We heard it, but you've got something better, which is the scriptures of God. It is completely sufficient. So in the Bible, the things we need to know is already written. Not those things we, we want to know, but the things we should know or we need to know have been clearly uh, written in the Bible. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 to 17, all scripture is God's breath. You said, I think we read that verse earlier. All of scripture, all of scripture is the breath of God, is the word of God. Now, but the reason we uh, read other, other things, other books about the Bible, or even as we read in the Catechism itself, um, the Catechism is not the word of God and should never be treated as the infallible word of God. It only just uh, unpacks the truth uh, of uh, scripture and summarizing that very well for us to be able to know uh, very so solid two things, what we need to believe concerning God and what is our duty before God. These two things are brought very clearly 
uh, through the, uh, the catechisms or the creeds that we confess when you're giving worship. Now let's conclude uh, our uh, class by talking about uh, question three. Question three will be our, conc our conclusion in our introduction today. And uh, I'll read the question, obviously, and then we'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give a few remarks or a few comments on that topic. But before we read question three, I'm gonna go back to question one uh, and we read the answer together. So what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Uh, well done uh, for those who have memorized it. And then the second question, what role has God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him? The word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. Yeah. Well done, those who are trying to uh, recite it and memorize it. Um, we shall look at the third question. And this will be the conclusion of our introduction. Uh, from tomorrow, we're getting into what we need to believe concerning God. So what do the scriptures principally teach? I'll repeat the question. What do the scriptures principally teach? The answer is, together, the scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. So this Bible that we have uh, been discussing about in the past few uh, minutes, they principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. Very important answer. I'm going to read that again, a question and answer. The question is, what do the scriptures principally teach? Together, the scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. And I'll read a few verses here. Uh, John 20, verse 30 to 31. As I said earlier, uh, John 20, verse 30 to 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so uh, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Amen. And the other one is uh, the book of Micah, uh, chapter 6, verse 8. Micah 6, 8. He has showed you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Walk humbly with your God. That's all God requires of you. So um, this question tells us that there are many things we cannot learn from, uh, from the Bible. Very many things we cannot learn from the Bible. Like history, for example. We can, we can learn some history, but we cannot learn all of history from the Bible. Uh, there is no any scientific um, theories in the Bible or equations and formulas in the Bible. We don't, we don't know those things from the Bible. We probably uh, need to get it from outside the Bible, those things. Even uh, the knowledge about Jesus himself, we don't know everything about Jesus from the Bible. We don't know everything about Jesus from the Bible. So the Bible only has the essential uh, knowledge that we need, but also it is true that the Bible is also an essential knowledge to all other knowledges. The Bible is essential for history. You must know the Bible to understand science. You must know the Bible to understand politics. You must know the Bible to understand salvation. Must, like The Bible is central and is essential to all true knowledge. So without the Bible, you cannot have a true understanding of anything. This is what this uh, question here uh, addresses us, or just partly the introduction of it. And that is because, uh, first of all, the Bible speaks about our faith and our duty. Uh, as I said yesterday, 
we divide uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism into two categories. Uh, question one to three is introduction, so that is separate. But the, the two major divisions is from question, question four to question 38, uh, which talks about what man is to believe concerning God, as stated in this answer. And then we also have question 39 to question 107, the last question, which is about the duty that God requires uh, of man, our duty. So faith comes before duty. That's what we see the organization of this document. So what a person believes uh, is very important. I know sometimes you've said, oh, it doesn't matter what you believe. Just believe whatever you believe. But that's very prob uh, prob uh, problematic. Um, <clears throat> what you believe is important. What you believe is important. So believe uh, or faith uh, is something real. Like we believe in we, we believe in actual faith, not just faith in in faith, but we believe in an actual object. That's what we believe in. So. Knowing what you believe is very important. So from, but from the question number four to question 38, pay close attention, and I will try as, as much as I can to cover at least this, this much in this semester. And if there is any need, we could uh, do the, the rest another time. And then duty. What about duty? Is faith only faith um, enough? What about our duty? A duty is important as well because uh, if you believe what God wants you to believe, then naturally you must believe what he wants you to do. You must believe what he is asking you to do. So you cannot say that I believe in God, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. If you believe in God, then you must believe in what he is asking you to do. So faith and duty are very important very important things. Um, and so I'll conc conclude by saying that uh, true Christianity has th those two things together, the doctrines and the life. We cannot separate these things. A good Christian is someone that has sound doctrine to know what you need to believe about God, about the Holy Spirit, about God the Son, about God the Father about the works of God, about the names of God, about the attributes of God. We need to know those things and believe in them because that's what the Bible is teaching. Uh, about man, about man, about creation, you know, about our redemption, how are we saved? All those things are part of the doctrines and how are we supposed to worship God? You know, how are we supposed to receive the word of God? What, what, what should, should we be doing now as we're waiting for Christ to come back? So doctrines are very important, but also life is important. Life. You following the Lord of God, enjoying the means of grace, and being able to pray, all of that is part of the life that we'll be covering later on. But those two things are very important. So um, what role, let's just read that uh, question as we finish. Question number three, what do the scriptures principally teach? And the answer is the scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father God, as we continue to go through the Westminster Shorter Catechism, uh, we pray that Father Lord, you will uh, enable us to uh, truly organize the doctrines so the Lord who may um, assess what we believe in and make sure the Lord we are believing in the correct content so the Lord through our faith you will also be glorified also Lord may you open our eyes to uh, realize our duty and help us not to neglect any of our duty Lord but to believe in you and also to believe in the things that Lord you are asking us to do for the glory and honor of your name we thank you so much for this time and I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ our Savior and our Lord Amen Thank you.